Steve Cuden on the fishbowl. Oh, welcome. <laughs> how did I get here? Or how did I get in here is the question. Right. How did you get in the fishbowl? A lot of squeezing in, into tight spaces. And, and I don't do well underwater. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, only only Sam Fish does, does well underwater. Well, I'm going to try to swim with you today, Sam, <laughs> if I can. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so, Steve Cuden has worked in the film and entertainment industry for, Me? for a while now and has had many, many awesome stories and experiences that he can mention, as well as being my former teacher and advisor, which is a great pleasure to have. You're the first uh, of, of the Point Park staff to be swimming in the bowl. Oh, man, am I honored. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we'll swim to it. All right, let's go. Um, first, I would like to talk about Exo Squad. Okay. And the concepts that were going on in that show. All right, that was a that was a very interesting show to work on, Exo Squad. Um, as you know, Sam, I I worked on ninety some odd different uh, episodes of animated television, um, thirty some odd different series. But that particular one was really fascinating. Why? Because uh, it was essentially the story of World War Two set in the distant future with warring factions from outer space. They weren't Nazis and allies or allies and, and, and Axis companies, countries. It wasn't that, but it was the same essential setup as to uh, one country bombed another country and off we go to having this big battle. And then there were major arcs in that show. It was one long arc. That show was 39 episodes long. And the, from the first episode to the 39th episode was essentially tracking World War II from beginning to end. And that, that show was such a essential part of my childhood growing up. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't be sorry, because as, as we've talked about this before, I am I am seeking to make Exo Squad live action. Wow, that'd be cool. You can talk about live action like on a stage, or are you talking about a movie? Movie. A movie of Exo Squad with real people. With real people. Wow, that that would be that would be great. Yeah, I there's there's I, I believe it could be like the next kind of Star Wars epic, in a sense. Not not at the same caliber as Star Wars, but definitely it. I I think there's a lot of material that's there that would work well with audiences mm -hmm. today. And especially, I think we have the technology today. And, to, I, and I think it would have a lot of resonance to what's going on in the world in general. Oh, today. exactly. Exactly. We, we're, we won't venture into politics, but we all know what's what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, we're, you know, there, there are still battling factions of various right. types around the world. And, and so ExoSquad would absolutely uh, be relevant to today. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the next show that I would like to discuss with you that you worked on was The Batman, especially since The Killing Joke is set to come out later this month, I'm, I'm sure, towards the end of the month. Something like that. Yeah. Um, again, The the Batman, uh, the, whole, the whole Batman animated series growing up was such an essential part of my childhood. I remember going to see... Um, Mask of the Phantasm in theaters. Um, I, I even really would like to make Batman Beyond into a uh, li live action movie um, because I feel like with that show in particular, we, we've gone with Bruce Wayne so many times um, and the, the classic Batman villains. Like, don't get me wrong, the Joker is his, his arch nemesis. But there's so many other villains in the Batman universe. Oh, the Batman universe is full full of grand villains. Right, and I, I I'm pretty, I'm one of the, probably the few people that's pleased with how Batman versus Superman turned out, and I'm actually excited to see the R-rated cut because Batman is one of those comic book series that I feel deserves to be done with an R rating just because 
it's it's a more gritty universe. I mean, DC's comics versus Marvel's are more gritty to begin with. I would I would say that the Christopher Nolan trilogy of Batman's the last three that have been done um, aren't truly art, but they're close to it. Right, and I I might get a lot of shit for this, but I, I like the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, but I don't view them as traditional Batman movies. Right. I, How do you view them? I view them as Christopher Nolan putting his twist on Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, I view the Tim Burton Batman movies as pretty close to resembling is that Batman. Because, is that because you felt that they were a little more comic book-like? Yes, and I felt he got it right with depicting the Batman universe in a live action well, Christopher realm. Christopher Nolan's version hues closer to the, tradi- not the not traditional, but the Frank Miller version, the Dark Knight, that, that very dark version of Batman. Right. And I, I get that, but I, I feel like um, Tim Burns, because that's what Tim Burns was also supposed to represent, was Frank Miller's. Um, but Tim Burton's was much lighter in tone. It, it than, was... Than what... Christopher Nolan's wound up being. It was, but it was... I mean, Batman Returns, I thought, was darker than any of the other Christopher Nolan movies. Um, And in fact, I thought that Christopher Nolan with um, The Dark Knight Rises basically took the concept that um, Batman Returns was going with in terms of what the Penguin was trying to do to Batman... Um, Bane basically did the same thing, in a sense, to Batman in The Dark Knight Rises. Except that if you think about it, Bane is a really dark, nasty character, and the Penguin, though, can be a dark, nasty character, was played more on the light side uh, in the Tim Burton movies. Sure, sure. I, I, I And again, I, I like the, the Nolan movies. Um, I, I thought The Dark Knight was probably the best out of the trilogy that he did. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really like where uh, the new Batman movies are going with the, the start of Batman versus Superman. Because um, I, I feel like that's that's going back to... It's combining like the, the imagery of the Tim Burton Batman movies and applying a much more new gritty concept and view on how Batman really is. I'm, um, I'm guessing you, you don't want it to be all as dark as it becomes in The Dark Knight Rises, for instance. Um, I, I felt that while it, all of Nolan's movies were um, a lot darker in tone compared to Tim Burton's, movies um batman movies i i I feel like giving batman an r rating is is gonna just up the ante on what they can show in terms of the universe that batman lives in i think that you're 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 correct uh for a, a fan to look at it that way but if you really think about what those movies are which is a gigantic commercial enterprise. Think about how many people that currently buy tickets to go see Batman movies would be not allowed to buy tickets. And then you'll come at it from the perspective of a businessman rather than as a fan, and you'll realize that, oh, wait a minute, I can't do an R movie on this because if I do an R, I have probably taken 150, maybe $300 million off of the table. That's true, but I also feel like with certain movies, um, if if the fan base is large enough, um, it it won't matter because. Um, well, three hundred million dollars matters. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I in anybody's it, it, universe, it def it definitely matters. I, I agree with you. It definitely matters, but it also I feel like depends on the type of film that it is because. Um, AVP, for instance, the first Alien vs. Predator, Mm -hmm. was done PG-13, and that whole fan base got, including me, um, got really upset with the fact that it was an R, and with the next one, the the second installment that they did, they, in every way, like, they kind of went too over the top with making it R and what was shown in it. 
Um, I definitely like the R-rated um, AVP Requiem, I think it's called, more than the first AVP because that that type of film needs to be R um, to begin with. And I think because of Deadpool, um, they're now going to make the next Wolverine movie R. Um, they're going to, the, the standalone Batman movie that Ben Affleck is going to uh, write, direct, and star in is planned to be R. And now they're coming out with um, an R-rated cut of Batman versus Superman. And I think the next phase of certain, not all comic book movies, but certain ones that kind of have a more gritty or um, violent tone in what they're representing. Like, like X-Men doesn't need to be R, but the way they portrayed um, Wolverine in terms of, you know, having lethal claws and everything, you're totally not utilizing what you can show with something like that, especially with technology today with lethal, you know, well, an, well, animantium well, we'll claws. We'll certainly see how those do. Um, we might be conceivably, I think, um, heading after a really long ride toward the end of comic book movies. I definitely think so. I think they've burnt themselves out pretty hard and they're still going to come out and there's still going to be more of them. I just think that the market is oversaturated with those kinds of movies and it probably needs a little bit of a break in order to regenerate the audience. And at, at the end of the day, going back to what I said a moment ago, at the end of the day, these things are not made just for pure fans. They are made for businessmen to make money and for stockholders to make money. That's what they're really made for. They're commercial enterprises. They're not personal, um, um, personal artwork of a filmmaker to show off just their personal side. They are actual really big time, big league commercial enterprises where they spend several hundred million dollars on each one. And the people that put the money into it, i.e. the studios are keenly interested in making that back. So uh, I think that there, you'll see that there may be versions like you're talking about an R rated version of this, but a PG rated version of that, of the same movie. Um, and that may be the future where they make movies purposefully, where they shoot two versions or extra footage in order to uh, give it an R rating. But I think you're always going to come back to how do we make the most money out of this particular property? Um, they're not, they're never, I don't think any of those movies are ever going to be a pure G rating. They're always going to be a PG, which, which allows younger children to, to be accompanied by adults um, or come in on their own up to at a certain age. And, that will be the that will be the um, middle point that studios will allow filmmakers to venture toward. But you're not. I don't think you're going to see too many movies come out as pure R's, and that's it. There are, just because it's it's so limiting to the audience. I definitely agree. I definitely agree. I think I think just going back to what I said, I think that some some of the whether it's Marvel or DC or even Dark Horse um, universes will be portrayed as R, but others will get a PG-13 or PG rating. That may be, that may be, you know, we'll see how it works, how it shakes down. Yeah, yeah, because that, that's, I think that's definitely the next phase. But again, I don't, I don't think it's enough to save um, the comic book, the no, comic book I, I genre think, I think as it is now. I think it's, now. it's burnt itself out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and we're starting to see reflections of that in some of the criticism of them. Definitely. I mean, from a screenwriting perspective, um, I, I didn't see Ant-Man in theaters, and they've been playing it like crazy on Stars now. And from a screenwriting perspective, that that film looks like they did two drafts. <laughs> And you know from drafts, don't you, Sam? I do. I do. Um, that I, like It really just felt like they just needed to pump that movie out clearly so they could just set it up to do Captain America versus, I mean, Captain America Civil War. And, and, that, and that may be, but I'm going to guess that it went through many more than two drafts. It just turned out to look that way to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, here's my uh, feeling about most movies. Um, nobody who cares at all about themselves 
or themselves, I should say, um, no one in that position, like a filmmaker, is ever going to attempt to make a movie on purpose that's bad. Movies can be made campy, which are on purpose to have a kind of a, um, a all satiric or, or maybe an intentionally poor look to them, but that's intentional. I don't think anybody sets out to make a movie intentionally badly or to do two drafts of Ant-Man. Right, movie. right. Everybody works very hard on it. It's just that sometimes things don't work. Uh, or, although I think that movie did extremely well at the box office. So. Oh, it definitely did because people love Ant-Man from the and comics. And they love Paul Rudd. They and they love Paul Rudd, which is really what it was. Sure. Um, sure. And, and that's what the studios are counting on. Uh, um, that people will come to see someone like Paul Rudd. They're banking on a star as well as the property's name and a, you know all the above. The the uh, the, the point is is that um, you don't you don't intentionally do two drafts and go make a movie. It just doesn't work like that. Right, and right. It just is that it, sometimes things don't work so well and it, it, it's art. And uh, even though it's commercial enterprise, there's an art factor to it. And there is no guarantee that what you set out to do, even though everybody has the best intentions, that it will turn out to be good. There's just no guarantee. Lord knows I've written enough junk in my life that I went, well, this is not going to work. And, and in fact, it didn't. Uh, and you work your butt off on it. It's that's not that's not what's in question. So, you know, unfortunately, sometimes folks go see a movie and go, what do they spend? They spent no time on this when, in fact, they spend as much time on it as the finest movie you've ever seen in your life. And that's that's the bottom line truth is that people spend as much time on what you deem poor as what you deem great. It's the same amount of effort, energy and time. And it just doesn't work for whatever reason. And it may be in post. It may be editing. It might be that the marketing got in the way and decided to change some things and they made things worse. And who knows? Who knows what the elements? Don't forget the. It's very important to realize that I know that you've been focusing on your screenwriting for the past few years, but let's not forget that the screenplay is just a blueprint for that end product called a movie or a TV show or whatever that would be, something on the internet perhaps. Um, and and it is a very, it, it truly is a, a collaborative group effort to make a motion picture of any kind, motion pictures of all kinds. <clears throat> it's truly a group collaborative effort. So it's never one person. So sometimes those elements don't come together so well. That's true. That's definitely very true. You know, it's like, it's not like, like John Carpenter movies, for instance. I mean, <clears throat> he, he doesn't always write and direct his own stuff, but um, certain films that he, that he's worked on come together definitely better than others. Well, I mean, that's the other thing is the people that have careers, not just make one movie like I've done. I've made one movie. That they're 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 people that have careers. They make seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty movies. Spielberg's now made twenty nine movies. Um, who knows how many Hitchcock made and so on. Um, some filmmakers over a career make a lot more than others. But if you have a career, it's highly improbable that you will knock it out of the bar park 100% of the time. I mean, after all, you think about the greatest baseball players that have ever lived, the greatest hitters in baseball who have ever lived, Ted Williams, and you go up the, the chain to the best hitters ever. The best that they could do is 4 out of 10. So 60% of the time, they're striking out or not getting on base. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, so how can, how can you expect an artist like a John Carpenter who's made many, many movies, to hit it out of the park every time. He, he won't. No no one does. Right. Scorsese's had his clunkers. Spielberg has had his clunkers. Ridley Scott. They've all had their clunkers. And it's just inevitable. And you you can't calculate why or how. It just is. It's just something doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, the point of at, from an artistic perspective is, is that you keep trying. If you can if people will allow you the privilege of having money to make something as expensive as a movie and you're able to make multiple movies, then you stand a chance of doing things that people like and that people don't like. By the way, every movie that you, and I know you've seen a few in your life, every movie that you have seen has, that every movie, actually, let me back up, every movie that you've seen that you liked, that you loved, 
has people out there that hated it. And every movie that you've hated, there are people out there that love it. So that's the other thing. It's, it's an art form, and you can walk into the grandest museums in the world, and you can look at what are widely considered to be the greatest paintings in the world, Picasso, Monet, Matisse, whoever, uh, Da Vinci, it doesn't matter who you're talking about. They look at the painting and two people standing side by side, and one person sees it as a great masterpiece, and the other, people, the other person thinks it's junk. So that's art. Right. Andy Warhol, for instance. What, about, what about Andy Warhol? Pittsburgh native. Painted a uh, Campbell's soup can. Some people look at it as... As a Campbell's soup as can. As a Campbell's soup can. Other people look at it as this is the most amazing thing ever. Well, that's... that. Yes, that's correct. And that is the way it works. Uh, I happen to like Andy Warhol. I, I happen to lo like him as well. So, I happen to like the Dandy Warhols. You like the Dandy Warhols. I wonder where they got that name. I, I it's it's a question that I've been pondering for quite quite a while now. My guess is you're going to continue to ponder for even a while more. I, I'm going to be, uh, you know, are you pondering what I'm pondering, Pinky? I, I hope that I don't wind <laughs> up pondering too long, because if I ponder too long, I'll be in a different kind of fish bowl. <laughs> I, I got to a VIP style for my birthday hangout with the uh, the Dandy Warhols. You did? I did. Wow, you're lucky. Can I touch you? <laughs> well, you have touched me, Steve. Not in that way, though. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad because the other way is not, not that appealing, Sam, to be perfectly honest about it. <laughs> awesome. Well... Let's move on to uh, <laughs> on that subject. Let's let's move on to the extreme Ghostbusters. Oh, and they were extreme. Yes, again another essential cartoon of my childhood, and with the new Ghostbusters coming out, I'm yeah. wondering what your viewpoint is on sh should they or shouldn't they have done an updated Ghostbusters. With women? With women. Well, nothing. I have nothing against women. I love women. <laughs> look, they made three Ghostbusters, right? Or did they just two, make two? They made two. two. And this would be the, the and then, third. And then two different cartoon series. Right. And this movie is the third Ghostbusters. Right. So was the first one sacred? No. No. So there's the answer to your question. And as far as I'm concerned, it, not none of it's sacred. Here's what, here's what bothers me, not about Ghostbusters. Uh, what bothers me is, is when folks go and remake a classic movie that works perfectly well as it is. So when someone decides, as they did, I don't know, 15, 20, maybe more years ago, that they would make a television version of Casablanca with David Soul, and I scratch my head and I go, why would you do that? There's nothing wrong with David Soul, and there's certainly nothing wrong with Casablanca. Why would you... Why would you even think about doing something like that? Or, you know, um, good for him, Gus Van Sant goes off and makes an actual shot-for-shot -shot remake of Psycho. Why? In color, no less. Right. Why? What's the point? What, that I don't understand. But if you want to take something, a story that exists, and go make something else that's in that vein, or riffs off of it, or is a sequel to it, I, I, I say, have at it. I've got no problem. It's when people remake things. That's what bothers me. So your question about what, what what's my take on um, the real Ghostbusters, extreme Ghostbusters, um, Ghostbusters 1, Ghostbusters 2, now Ghostbusters with the all women. Uh, great. I've got no problems with it. As, here's, here's the other thing that I object to mightily. When the story sucks, then I have a problem. I'm all about great storytelling. You know that from taking my classes. That's what I focus on, is it not? And, and the elements of what make, makes great storytelling, characters, structure, and so on, those, those many elements that go into making a, a, a screen story or even a play, I object when storytelling is bad. I, otherwise, I don't care. I don't care what you do. It's a story. So if somebody wants to do it. If you're going to remake a classic, you'd better make it better than the classic. Otherwise, there's no point. And it's pretty hard to remake some classics. So there are a lot of people out there, a lot of fanboys out there that are um, truly uh, uh, objecting to the notion that how dare these filmmakers, how dare Paul Feig go off and make a female version of, 
of Ghostbusters. Well, that's your problem. Just don't go see it. That's the other thing. You have this incredible ability in the world, America in particular, but even much of the world. You get to vote. You get to say, hey, I'm not going to go see it. I'm not going to give them any money. So what are you complaining about? Stop complaining. Why are you complaining that they, they've made a female version of Ghostbusters? Why are you complaining about that? So just don't go. So who's forcing you to go see it? But these people, they whine about that stuff, and I don't know why. I don't quite get it. It's, it's, the, it's the truth. To, to, it's... to quote William Shatner, get a life. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's the same thing with um, this, this, the new Star Wars movies. Everybody's all, like complaining that there's there's logic issues with you know how does how how can Kylo Ren you know stop a laser you know when he he's not fully trained and everything and how can you know Ray um, have the the abilities that she has and with no real guidance or training in the Force tax tactics. I think if you don't have the actual ability to change what the filmmakers are making or a playwright is writing if you don't have the ability. So who has that ability? Studio executives, fellow artists that, that have influence, the actual people working on the movie have influence on what's going to be made. But if you're a fan and you don't have the ability to make the change, why are you complaining about it? What is it you think you're going to do? Well, you're just belly aching for, for the sake of belly aching from my perspective. You're welcome to, I mean, it's your, you know, you have the perfect right to, to voice your opinion, and many people do. And in fact, probably more people voice their opinion than should, but people voice their opinion. They have every right to do so. Here's what I'm saying to people. If you don't like what you see, go make your own. Exactly. Go show us what you would do. Go make your own. Go do something and bring something great to the world so that we can all see it instead of complaining about what somebody else has done. Exactly. What's the point? Why? What's, what, how, does it ser how does it solve anything? How does it serve anybody? Where? What good does it do to, in the world? If it gets it off your chest, so be it. Get it off your chest. But what's the point? Exactly. Exactly. It's like some opinions just need to be kept to themselves Unless, well, they're, unless they, they're entitled to say they're, they're entitled to say what they want to say, but at the same time, it's like you know, stop whining unless you're going to do something about it. Look, I'm a I'm a very big proponent and advocate of the First Amendment, right? And I do not believe in any kind of um, editorializing to prevent people from saying what they want to say. Um, Absolutely. I, don't, I don't believe in squelching free speech at all. And I believe people should have the right to do that. And great, good for them. But uh, uh, but I say if you're going to complain about something and you can't do anything to change it, go make your own and prove to us how wonderful things can be. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And by the way, most of those people that complain don't have that ability, so that's why they don't. Uh, they either don't have the money, they don't have the talent, they don't have the skill, they don't have the knowledge, whatever it is, they just like to complain. So those of you that are listening to this that just like to complain, okay, go complain. Become a film critic then. <laughs> I think they already are. <laughs> go be a filmmaker. Go write. Go create. Go be a positive force in the world. Is that, that, is that a good way to say it? That's a great way to say cool. it. Cool. Awesome. Well, I just want to throw in my two bits about Ghostbusters real quick. Sure. Um, I did hear that. Not that, not that I want your opinion, Sam. <laughs> okay, we we are in swimming in the fishbowl. Yes. Uh, the deepest depths of the sea. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, SpongeBob just went by. <laughs> Patrick, there you are. <laughs> oh, SpongeBob. <laughs> Squidward. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Gotcha. All right. Um, I did hear. I do know that. The remaining original Ghostbusters are making a cameo in the new Ghostbusters. <laughs> and I, I did hear that Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray um, are teaming up to do an official, um, re, the, of the remaining team, to do an official Ghostbusters 3 or 4, whatever you want to call it, in, in this day and age, reboot, whatever, 
um, that's going to come after uh, this Ghostbusters. Because well, good luck. You, 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 you let me know if that happens. <laughs> I, I think that the stumbling block has been twofold for all these years because they've tried forever to do another one. And the stumbling block has always been Bill Murray Bill doesn't Murray. like the script. Exactly. That's the stumbling block they've always fallen into or, or bumped into. And um, so if they're able to get uh, a script that Bill Murray likes and signs on, I think it's a slam dunk to get it made. I think so, too, and I think that's what they're now trying to work on because um, a lot of the original fans that grew up with the original Ghostbusters and the Ghostbusters cartoons like me and kids my age and a little bit older um, have have kind of have an issue with, not, not with the fact that Ghostbusters is an all-female cast, but it's remaking something like you said that... Is is a classic that? Do we that, know that it's a remake? I think I think now what they're trying to do is have this be a lead up to the next official Ghostbusters, which is going to have the original. I, cast. I haven't read anywhere that it's a remake. I have I it's haven't a late, either. It's a later iteration. Yeah, it's a later iteration, and I think now because of a lot of people saying that, well, it, it, this is good, but we want the real Ghostbusters back, you know, and I think that's, that's why, um, they're including the original, the remaining original cast as cameos in it. And I think that's what they're trying to do leading up to, um, the remaining original cast to come back and do another installment, whether it happens or not remains to be seen. But, um, I, I for one would love to see Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, back in action if only Harold Ramis could be there. That would be very uh, unique since he's no longer of this mortal coil. Right, right. Maybe we can throw him in as a hologram well, or something. Well, we're not we're not terribly far away. I, I don't think we're like right on the verge of it, but we're not terribly far away from the day and age where they will be able to synthesize uh, an actor in computer graphics and um, emulate voice so that they could write whole new lines and sequences for an actor who's no longer living and plug them into a new movie and we won't be able to tell the difference. As it is right now, nobody has created a, uh, a realistic enough human, a basic human. We are able to make monsters fine. We're able to make shiny things fine, but we're not really great at making human characters yet, the eye movements, the facial expressions, and so on, where we can't tell. Human beings are spectacularly, uh, um, uh, what would the right word be, that we are spectacularly gifted with the ability to tell when something isn't human. We can just tell when something isn't human. And we haven't quite gotten the CG or the robotics down, either one, to where we can't tell. But we're getting close. We're getting really close. And if they get there, then maybe they could go make a Ghostbusters with Harold Ramis. It's true. It's true. I mean, the, the latest Tron movie got pretty close to um, utilizing that technology. We are getting really close. What's still not quite 100% there is, is eyes and facial expressions. Right. Body and movement, they've gotten down pretty well. Right. It is, and voice. It's those three things. And if they ever get that down, well, good luck to a lot of today's actors trying to be stars uh, or just even actors. And, um, you know, I didn't think that we'd ever hear of, let alone see, uh, a script or a book or anything like that written by a computer that would have any value. But I'm starting to see news articles about people have dumped hundreds and hundreds of screenplays into a computer and told it to make a new screenplay. And out comes this stuff. Well, somebody already shot one uh, starring Thomas, Thomas Middleditch, who's uh, one of the stars of Silicon Valley. And I have to say the writing of it is just god-awful. But there it is. Right. And so that will, they will improve and improve and improve. And maybe one of these days a computer is going to spit out a worthy script. Uh, and that scares the heck out of me. Fortunately, Sam, I've been around long enough where it's no longer going to impact my career, likely. <laughs> But it might impact yours. It might impact mine. <laughs> you know, if you're around long enough, it, right. it, it may impact yours. 
Uh, I, I hope not. I think that what makes what makes humans unique is we're able to um, take <clears throat> the concept of one plus one plus one and make it equal seven in a screenplay or a piece of art or a dance or any kind of artwork that uh, that we have the ability to make a leap over logic, whereas computers still are very somewhat linear in their thinking and that the logic is A plus B equals C, but I think humans are able to go A plus B equals HDF. I, I agree. And, I, and going back to what you taught me at my time here at Point Park is the seven plot points. Oh, you learned something. <laughs> I did. Thank goodness. I did. And uh, from going from sequencing to the 15 alley cat beats to seven plot points. You mean save the cat. Save the cat, right. Um, though, though you might be able to apply it to an alley cat. Right, right. Save the cat. Um, it's the seven plot points is just like, like you said at your uh, presentation a few weekends ago. Mm -hmm. It leaves more leeway for creativity. Yeah. And that, that's where... It's less rigid. It is, and, and that's where... Save the Cat, by the way, is very good. There's nothing wrong with Save the Cat. And for a lot of people who are struggling to figure out how to structure their screenplay, there's nothing wrong with Save the Cat. It's 15 beats. But um, Blake Snyder in that book calls for uh, folks to very rigidly um, follow these 15 beats, and, and here are the exact page counts on which you should hit those 15 beats. And that tends to make... Many, many, many screenplays come out rigidly sort of similar. They have a very similar feel to them. And so a lot of Hollywood executives have noticed that over time, that there are a lot of screenplays they're receiving that are uh, rigid. And, um, and so w what I try to do in my, my new book, Beating Hollywood, is to give you different looks at it. So I created the chapter system, which is sequencing, uh, which gives you fluidity that plays in line with the seven plot points. So, you know, um, when you are able to uh, take these milestones that, that all s stories have, all worthy stories that you have recognized as Western story watchers, um, as an audience member, uh, you ha are, are constantly looking for these milestones to be hit, even though you don't know what they are and you don't need to know what they are. You just recognize when something's not right, and you go, well, something's wrong here, but you don't know why. And it's usually because the milestones are not quite right. So those seven plot points, you know, normal world, inciting incident, point of no return, midpoint, big gloom, climax, and new normal, those seven plot points are must be met in order for audiences to recognize the story's been told. <clears throat> Absolutely. And... It's also, like you said, I feel it leaves more creativity for the writer to apply that's correct. To, to their their script. That's correct. That's I think that's correct. And, and that's really, in my opinion, all you need in order to tell the story. The others are helpful, especially if you're lost and don't know what's, what you're right. doing. They're helpful. They've got good guides. Um, but you only need the seven plot points in order to tell. But, you, but if you don't hit those seven plot points or you hit them... Um, some in some cases too close together or um, not powerfully enough, you have a problem. They're just turning points in your story. That's all they are. They're turning points. Without those turning points, um, the audience grows restless because you're not progressing. Right. And just to uh, be clear, that um, the new uh, normal world and inciting incident can be kind of at the same moment at the same moment or even reversed occasionally if you look at the, the, the one example that i always go to <clears throat> though it's really rare most of the time you get a normal world that it eventually leads to an inciting incident not long thereafter uh, but the one movie that has its inciting incident famous movie that has its inciting incident before we get to the normal world of the protagonist although it is the normal world so it's really the same but you get your inciting incident right off the bat is dirty harry yeah. Where you've got the sniper on the opposite building who guns down a woman swimming in a pool. And that happens before we meet Dirty Harry. And that is the normal world. I mean, the normal world is this, this guy's killing people and the detective has to come in and solve it. But it's unusual to get that inciting incident up front before we get any kind of 
sense of what the normal world is. Well, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, for instance, you you kind of get the the normal world and inciting incident right and, off the and bat. And that's perfectly fine. There's absolutely nothing storytelling-wise with that. In other words, that's okay. But if you suddenly had in a story your normal world and inciting incident, and within a, uh, within a minute you then jumped into your second act where you've gone past, past the point of no return, you've missed a whole act. Right. Right? You've missed a whole movement worth of storytelling to set up what should go on in act two or the second movement, and that's a problem. Right. And also the big gloom, climax, and uh, new normal can come uh, quite quickly depending on what you're, what type of film you're writing. Yes, big gloom can lead into the climax quite quickly, and sometimes... Climaxes can lead quite quickly into your normal, new normal. Uh, it just depends. There, there, there is no, there, are, there are no rules. These are, these are um, guidelines that have occurred to people through a couple of thousand years of observation of storytelling, and it's all based. All these thoughts as to how stories lay out are based on pattern recognition of great storytellers telling great stories over a long period of time, and people looking at them studying them and going, well, how does that work? And here's how it works. It works like this, 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 and this. And if you do it that way, it doesn't work so well. So let's do this, 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 and this as, a, as guidelines. And now people know, you know, people who understand this will write to that. And then there are lots and lots and lots of really talented, gifted, successful, money-making writers in the world who have no idea what I'm talking about. And they are naturally gifted at just knowing, oh, I've seen what it is, is they've grown up watching this story and that story and this story and that story. And they go, oh, I see how that works. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell this story and I'm going to follow this kind of pattern. And that's what it is. It's pattern recognition. And they get it intuitively without knowing any of the academic part of it. And that's perfectly acceptable, too. You don't have to go to um, you don't have to understand this. You don't have to go to a school or get an education in how to actually craft these things in order to craft them. If you're observant enough and study enough and diligent enough, you can do it on your own. I mean, I had a nice, long, healthy career in Hollywood, and I had no knowledge of this, of the academic part of this. I was doing it intuitively, and lots of writers do. So I think it's ext I wish I had known it earlier. It would have saved me a lot of grief because I went through a lot of hell trying to understand how to make a story work and it would have been a lot of, lot easier on me if I knew so I, I think there are advantages to knowing but at the same time you don't have to know it's an art form there are no there are no actual rules right and by the way I was one of the, I'm one of the people that grew up watching thousands of movies as a kid yes. and uh, I un I understood the pattern and because I understood the pattern, I knew I wanted to study that. And well, you're, you're, uh, that's good for you, and one, you're one of many who have made that decision. You're trying to find your leg up in the world of being a professional writer. Well, good for you. you know, more power to you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I just want to say I have watched a recent film with Ryan Reynolds that came out last summer called uh, Selfless. And um, this is basically a reinterpretation of a 90s B-grade uh, sci-fi film called Free Jack. And uh, Ryan Reynolds is basically, uh, they're taking the concept of what Free Jack was based on and kind of like upping the ante on it. And in this film, um, you kind of get the normal world first, the inciting incident, pretty soon after the normal world is introduced. Um, the, the point of no return comes exactly when it should, and then you kind of have half an hour, 40 minutes of uh, up until the midpoint, and then the big gloom, climax, and... Uh, new normal come quite quickly. Um, I've noticed from taking your classes and everything, I now go to the movies, and when I see the movie the first time, I, my screenwriting mind is looking at it from the seven plot points. Well, that then. sounds like I've ruined things for you. <laughs> no, I enjoy it because now it's like I'm like enjoying the movie, but also my screenwriting mind is looking for 
the, the seven plot points embedded Good. throughout the film and in this film it, it's an awesome awesome film and they it also shows that you can make a great um, sci-fi film with not really using too many major effects um, oh, sure absolutely and, and I, I feel like that's another thing we've kind of strayed from there, there, there was a, a famous television series that did that quite well called the Twilight Zone exactly almost no effects really exactly the effects you know what the effects were Sam you know what the special effects were good writing great acting exactly direction acting camera work those were the special effects exactly they didn't need CG they didn't need any kind of fancy pyrotechnics. Uh, they didn't need fast cars. They didn't need lots of guns. They just told great stories of people in conflict with themselves and other people. And when you do that, if you do that right, you're going to win every time. Exactly. My God, there's something on the wing. Yeah, my God, it's correct. <laughs> it's it's it, what, it's Back one to of Shatner. Right, right. right. It's one of my, my all-time favorite series, and I, I love anthology series and anthology movies so much that that's what I'm going to try and bring back, in a sense, is anthology movies. Um, I, I always love the idea that you pay money to go see one movie, and in a sense, you get to see, you know, four to five movies in one movie. It's just that idea always a, a appealed to me. And with my own personal storytelling abilities, um, I find that I like writing in a more like condensed um, story, like 20 to 30 pages or 20 to, to 40 pages in a sense, um, versus doing an entire, you know, feature length that's one self-contained story. I mean, some people find it, it's, it's the exact opposite, but... Um, I don't know, my, my writing, I guess I found that having self-contained stories kind of, whether it's making up one larger story or it's just the one self-contained story in itself, um, that's just my, my own personal well, that's taste. Well, your, that's your personal taste and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't know that you see too many examples of that out there. Occasionally you do like Grindhouse and stuff like that where there are multiple stories or creep show movies where there's multiple stories in one. Um, they're kind of rare. They you are. Know, most people want to go see one story and see it through to the bitter end, whatever that is at 90 to 140 minutes somewhere in there. Um, but you know, there's no reason why you can't make those. Yeah. You know, that's your, your multiple story agenda. Right. Right. In fact, the script that I let you let you have today is, one entry into a larger anthology film that I'm working on. So well, it's going to have me on the edge of my seat. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about beating Hollywood. All right, let's go. <laughs> um, you kind of mentioned it already that it's breaking down uh, different versions of the seven plot points, and it, it's it's way it's way beyond that. But yes, it does that too. Um, beating Hollywood. Uh, is a partner book or a com companion book to the first book I wrote, which was called Beating Broadway. Uh, Beating Broadway, uh, how to create stories for musicals that get standing ovations. I wrote that, uh, published it three years ago, um, because I, I was determined that there'd be some kind of a book in the world that expressed how famous musicals actually broke down, narrative structure-wise beats, plot points, and so on. And there was nothing like it in the world. In fact, there's, there was nothing like it before beating Hollywood in the screenwriting world either, in the movie world. Uh, not, not that I'm aware of anyway. If somebody knows of one, I'd be happy to entertain it. But I've looked at and read a whole lot of books, I mean, way more than 50 uh, screenwriting books, and I've never seen anything that kind of does what I tried to do in beating Hollywood. In beating Broadway, I took 40 famous musicals and broke them into their narrative beats, plot points, uh, and, and acts, uh, so that writers, producers, directors, actors, anybody that's interested in musicals can see how these stories actually work beat for beat, moment for moment, uh, and how they're structured. 
Um, so then the natural follow-up to that would be, well, let's do this for movies. So then this year um, I published uh, Beating Hollywood, Tips for Creating Unforgettable Stories. Un unforgettable screenplays, rather. Well, it's all storytelling. Um, and um, my goal was, and still is, to show people how stories break down, how you create moment for moment the 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 the, the the way stories actually lay out beat for beat. And uh, what I did is I wrote 150 tips on uh, plot, character, structure, um, how you conduct business as a screenwriter, and so on. Uh, and then I followed that up with 40 classic movies that most people who are movie lovers will have seen most of, if not all of. You've probably seen most or all of those movies, maybe not every one of them, but you've seen a huge chunk of them. So it goes from Annie Hall all the way to The Wizard of Oz. You've got both of the first two Godfathers. You've got Chinatown, The French Connection, uh, Being There, Thelma and Louise, Sunset Boulevard, Rocky, uh, movies like that. Classic movies, are, are uh, 40 of them are in this book, all broken down into what I call their three movements. I prefer to think of instead of acts, because movies don't generally stop like you do in the theater, you take an act break. Um, movies don't stop. They, we talk about acts when we talk about writing movies, but uh, I think of it more like music. Music has movements to it, and movie has movements to it. So there are three major movements, beginning, middle, and end, which is extremely difficult. It's easy to say beginning, middle, and end about anything, but it's extremely, extremely difficult to actually arrive at the proper beginning, how does that fall in this big middle, and, and how do you properly end a movie so that you don't start before it begins and end after the story is over? And how do you work, what are those places that you find? This is extremely challenging to do well. It's easy to do it badly, but it's challenging to do well. Um, and then uh, I've also broken them into all the narrative beats and plot points, the seven plot points, Plus, I've also added, as I alluded to earlier, these chapters or sequences. I started to think about movies in terms of um, novels. Now, are they perfect one-for-one -one equivalent to novels? No, uh, but they're close enough. And when you deal in um, fairly commonly structured novels, mystery novels, most horror novels, and so on, they're not where they're not quote unquote literary novels that can meander all over the place, like some massive, uh, excellent, well known novels will meander all over the place. And you can do that in a novel. You cannot do that, can't get away with it in a movie. A movie must follow a fairly straight line called a through line, in which uh, you're, or the spine of the movie, which you're following uh, a protagonist story from beginning to end through the what we call a character arc, which is usually the protagonist's want at the beginning of a movie defined by uh, the inciting incident, which is, drives the story forward as to this is what I want. And that then drives you through the rest of the tale in this spine, this through line or this arc to what a character ultimately needs. So from want to need. So a character may want to rob a bank, but when they get in there and go to rob the bank, they find a teller that uh, unexpectedly they they have an attraction for, they fall in love with the teller during the course of this story, and they realize that their need is that they need love. So you go from the want of money to the need of love, and that's a character arc. Now that's very simple and basic stuff. Sometimes they're much more complicated than that, but <clears throat> that's the most basic underlying stuff of good storytelling in movies. Um, uh, the, the chapters are useful because you're able to see the, the book, not quite in the seven plot points, though they track with the seven plot points, you're able to see um, uh, the, the story laid out in chunks rather than in here's a milestone or meeting and meeting and meeting. So it goes from the rules of the road to a grand goal to um, uh, uh, what's the third one? So it's the same as, so you, you wind up going into Destiny Beckons. Um, You've had grand discoveries, great discoveries, destiny beckons, uh, down a rabbit hole with no way out, clawing back out of the hole, and then a new home at last. 
So they track with the seven plot points, but they're not the exact same seven. There's, there's eight of them. And so um, uh, uh, that helps you to see, I think it helps students and, and writers and everyone else that is keenly interested in creating movie stories. How do I get from A to B to C in a story based on the way the world wants to see stories laid out? And I say the, the way the world wants to see it because I've, I and others before me have observed these patterns. I've already talked about this a number of times today, but there are these patterns that, that all movies of any success follow. Are there examples of movies that don't follow these patterns well? Yeah, sure. It is an art form. It's not, it's not there are no rules. So The Godfather, which I break down, follows the, this pattern, but it's on a very big and slightly messier scale because it's such a huge story with so many characters in it. But at the end of the day, you're still following a protagonist. Who's the protagonist of The Godfather? Well, it winds up being Michael. It's Michael's story. He's the one that goes from the want at the beginning, the want to not be a member of his family's business, to needing to be the head of the family business. That's a pretty big arc. Um, you can see a movie like Pulp Fiction structurally looks like it doesn't follow it. Now, Pulp Fiction is not in Beating Hollywood. It's not broken down in there. But it, too, follows the seven plot points or the, the, uh, the chapters. But it just looks like it doesn't because we come back in time and have this funny structure to it. Th those movies defy the basic pattern recognition. But I say to students all the time, you've heard me say it, more than once. Um, you do not, as a speculative screenwriter, having never sold before, as a new writer, or even a struggling writer who's been around a while, uh, you do not want to challenge the system too hard with your brand new structure that people will not be able to follow. You haven't been given that right. You haven't sold yet to the point where the studio system trusts you. So I always say, Write something that is more bread and butter, meat and potatoes, whatever you want to call it, of the way that the world works, the way that people expect stories. And once you become a Quentin Tarantino or a Coen Brothers or somebody else that's iconoclastic, once you become that, then you can go sell your work to studios, networks, producers, and so on, uh, who are willing to take a chance on your new oddball story. Uh, so in order for Christopher Nolan to make Memento, he had to make things prior to it that weren't Memento-like. Uh, in order for Quentin Tarantino to make Pulp Fiction, he needed to uh, sell uh, true romance and make Reservoir Dogs first. In order for the Coen brothers to get to make Fargo and many of the movies they've made beyond it, they had to make Blood Simple first. So they had to prove themselves more meat and potatoes straight down the line, classic storytelling people so that the studios trusted that they knew what they were doing. Otherwise, they fear that their money is just going to go into a hole and it's a big mess. <clears throat> and in fact, sometimes it does happen that way. But when you see these folks come out of the other side of it and turn out this great, extraordinary, unique, and different work, it's that they had to prove themselves first. So that my, that's my encouragement to certainly new writers and also to those who have been writing and writing and writing and not selling. You need to think about not writing your great, unique artwork that's different from the rest of the world. You need to think about selling something to the studio system or producers that they want, that the world wants. Now, when I say the world wants it, usually the world doesn't know it wants what it wants, but they know it when it's wrong. And that's usually the definition of, to me, what the world doesn't want when they know it's wrong. So when they recognize a movie and, yeah, this is what we want to see, then you've hit it. When you hit it, you stand the chance of being able to make something else that's different later. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Well, I'm not sure it made sense to me, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> I yeah. think I think that made such perfect sense. And, and, and that is what I'm trying to get across in Beating Hollywood. That is the, the my major... Uh, it, my major goal in beating Hollywood is to um, 
not just write one more stinking screenwriting book because there's so many of them out there, but to write something that has value to write to writers who are really trying to figure out how to write what the studio system and what major producers and what big audiences want. I'm all about that. I think that that pretty much sums it up to exactly what it needs to be. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> well, I think that's a good place to stop. Wonderful. Uh, Steve, I'd like to thank you for swimming in the bowl. Oh, no, Sam. Thank you. I, I've enjoyed getting wet. <laughs> Well, now it's time to get dry and uh, sw swim out of the bowl. But, but Sam, there are no towels. <laughs> well, you know, the, we, we have uh, the jacket from Back to the Future Part Two. Ooh. You, you, you are because we're in we're 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 now actually past 2015. So we 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 have the hoverboard. We have. We just need the flying cars. We don't have a, uh, what was the flux capacitor? Wait, right, the flux capacitor. Well, I actually, I have a flux capacitor in my car. Does it work? It lights up. It lights up. Oh, wow. <laughs> I haven't gone 88 miles per wow. hour yet, so. Try it. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you for coming on the fishbowl. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure being with you. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for uh, swimming in the bowl. <laughs>